so you can you will thank you very much the Cairo to Greece for accepting to have this conversation mm -hmm. and uh, it's a great honor for us once again to meet you my pleasure okay. and uh, the first thing that we would like to ask you is uh, how did you come to devote your professional life to work in the university of the um, kind of coincidence, maybe the Lord made the decision for me. <laughs> um, actually, when I was a student of psychology, as you know, I had a tiny little job in a university hospital. I inherited the job from a girlfriend. She left the job and said, the professor might look for somebody, are you interested? It was only about money. And uh, this professor was the one who uh, applied for project money from the federal government to do the first study on South Africa. And when he received uh, the money, he bought the letter saying he will get the money, he called me at home and said, uh, Mr. Matsat, uh, I'm going to start a project. I need two psychologists. Would you like to be one of them? You have five minutes time to make a decision. So what could I say? I said yes. Yeah. Okay, that's the start. That's how and it started. The name of the professor? It was Michael Lukas Müller, the German self-help group Pope. You got this. Uh, the Pope of <laughs> so there was a Pope in our eyes. <laughs> I'm, I'm only um, bishop. Okay. <laughs> and uh, how was this field? Was this field? <laughs> how was this field of self-help mutual aid support viewed by social scientists and health professionals when you started? Actually, there was no no, no research at all before that. That was really a breakthrough. And uh, you should know that he was, first of all, a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he was a group therapist. And thirdly, he had been to the United States and had learned about AA and 12 steps groups mm -hmm. as one route to understand that people without a psychotherapist could be successful. When he transported this idea to the scientific community, which in this case is the community of psychoanalysts, psychotherapists, doctors, psychiatrists, group therapists, he was a complete outsider, of yeah, course. Like, like, <laughs> like all the starters are. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> okay. yes. um, but being a professor in a German university, you have a certain standing. And obviously somebody in the ministry had some sympathy for that approach, mm -hmm. which was close to the people, um, trusting in their capabilities, etc. That was a special person in, in the ministry. And during our conference here, uh, the term of enlightened mm -hmm. bureaucrats was yeah, used, yeah, and yeah. I think he was that. Uh, I could tell you why, but that's not uh, for here. Okay. And um, even during the project period, which was three years then, or three and a half, we still had some troubles with the university bureaucracy. <laughs> and the funny story, there are less funny stories as well, but the funny story is, that we had some rooms in the hospital department for psychosomatic medicine. Mm -hmm. Psychosomatic medicine in Germany is different from psychiatry. We have psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine. I can explain if you want. We had some rooms in the cellar of one of our buildings which were not really used and we could give it for free to the groups to have a meeting. And by the way, for the groups, it was very helpful in this early period to be in the cellar of a university hospital. Because in the university hospitals, wrong things do not happen. <laughs> yeah. okay. And uh, 
in a, in a symbolic way, they could hear our voices on the first floor, right? Mm. So in a homeopathic doses, we were present. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our, our trust in them, if you want. Okay, back to the funny story. We had a fight with the bureaucracy of the university who said the ceiling is so low in these rooms in the cellar, they are not allowed to be used by patients because in Germany everything is regulated. Okay. So we said, no problem, they are not our patients, they are citizens. So the bureaucrat says, if they are not patients, they are not entitled to use the hospital patients. facilities. Yeah. You know, that kind of funny stories in the beginning. Yeah. Today, if I may add that, yeah. today many hospitals in Germany say, we are proud <laughs> to be self-approved supporters. <laughs> yeah. how, how much work this change means. <laughs> Sorry? How much work is being, uh, uh, was needed in order to, to have now the hospitals to be proud of. To change well, this attitude. Yes. Um, well, the beginning was in 1977. Yeah. So it's nearly 40 years, years ago. <laughs> and uh, this first project that uh, Professor Miller mm -hmm. uh, suggested to the Ministry, what was it about? Yes, it was about a tricky technical term. We called it psychological therapeutic groups, self-help groups, right? In order to avoid the term psychotherapeutic, mm -hmm. in order to avoid direct confrontation with the professionals doing psychotherapy. Yeah. And we did not pretend this is psychotherapy. We said it is something similar, like therapy, something which might have therapeutic effects even if it is not psychotherapy. And that is what the project is about. We want to learn more about this. Remember AA. You never know what they are exactly doing, what is exactly helping, but in some way it does help some. Some. Some, right. And we had the same question. Could, this, could a certain format of self-help group be helpful for people with, let's say, neurotic diseases. Yes. And what was the situation regarding self-help groups back then? Sorry. What was the situation regarding uh, self-help ah, groups okay. themselves at, at the 70s? Okay, okay. In Germany. Um, there were already some, mm -hmm. actually quite a number, but they were not seen. Mm -hmm. Nobody was aware of not the doctors, not the psychotherapists, not the researchers, not the health insurances. In, in Germany, the health insurances are a very important player. Mm -hmm. So they were there, but nobody was aware of them. Mm -hmm. In a dirty corner of our society. And I think that was one of the most important effects of our project, to put the spotlight on them. Mm -hmm. So in those days, of course, we had uh, some uh, 12 steps groups, like everywhere in the world. And we had quite a number of groups in the field of somatic diseases, chronic diseases, parents groups, cancer groups just were about to start. Uh, some groups for psychological problems, that, that was the, in the beginning of the situation. Yeah. So we were talking about uh, 1977, and uh, let's go uh, to nowadays. Which is the situation in the field of self-help groups and self-help support nowadays? Yes. After 40 years. Yes. Almost 40 years. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think I can say that today self-help is very settled in Germany. It's very respected. 
is part of mainstream situation. It's no longer outsiders, left revolutionary, alternative things. It's quite the we say it's, it arrived in the middle of our society, which is meant to be positive. Right? And the numbers we have is that roughly speaking, estimating, we have about 100,000 self-help groups covering all fields from addiction to psychological problems to cancer to diabetics to family groups, you know, parents of children, etc. Um, but also in the social field, people after divorce, um, people who lost loved ones. Um, we, have, we, we even have groups for breastfeeding. <laughs> breastfeeding is not a disease, it's, a it's not even a problem, maybe it's a solution or a prevention <laughs> to many problems. But in modern times there, were a gen there was a generation of women who were not aware of how to handle the baby and in modern times, there is no mother or mother-in-law or older sister to help you and show you. So they created self-help groups. So if I speak about self-help groups in this context, it's covering all purposes. So the number 100,000. But don't forget that the German population is 80 billion. Okay. Um, the smaller half of these groups are members or chapters or branches of larger, what we call, self-help organizations. So whereas in self-help groups, we, we think people sit together face to face on a regular basis, be it weekly, every fortnight, every month, whatever, at Monday night at 8 o'clock, whatever. Uh, it is clear who is a member of the group, who is, not, who is not a member of the group. So a certain arrangement, a certain format. Mm -hmm. The self-help organizations usually work on national level and their aim is to influence the outside world. The politicians, the doctors, the health insurances, mm -hmm. the public. For example, to provide the public with information about this disease. Please understand what it means to have rheumatism, etc. They are also the political wing, if, if we want to say two wings of self-help. There's the more psychological wing in the groups, and the more political wing in uh, the self-help organizations. There are about 300, 400 self-help organizations and about 120 of them are under one umbrella. So they are, there's an umbrella organization having 220 member organizations, not individual members, but member organizations. The largest of these member organizations has 260,000 members. And the umbrella represents more than 1 million members. And you can easily imagine what a political power is. I always put it in this way, if you go to a politician and say, I'm the president of the so-and-so uh, association, we have 260,000 members, they are all grown-ups, they all have the right to vote in the next election. Would you please uh, give me uh, an opportunity to talk to you? next day. Right? If you are a small group, we are 12 and we have a depression, the Lord Mayor is not so in a hurry to give you uh, a debt. Okay. So that's the political influence and also the other thing you might call the clinical influence or whatever. The third element in German self-help, next to the self-help groups, self-help organizations, are the self-help contact centers, self-help centers, self-help clearing houses you never know how to use in uh, foreign languages. That means there is a professional person 
or maybe two, or maybe three, who is about to support everybody who comes to this center, being a kind of lighthouse in this area, with any question concerning self-help groups. So the classic question is, is there a group for my purpose, for my problem? If not, how can you help me to found a new one? Mm -hmm. If yes, how can I approach? Are there any preconditions? Are there any rituals? Who is the contact person? Can I just drop in, like in a 12-step group? Or do, you, do they want to have an interview first, or whatever? Uh, what can I expect if I go there? What's going to happen? I'll give you one example. If we talk about a group of MS patients, multiple sclerosis, and my multiple sclerosis has just started, and I have a little strange feeling in my finger, and a little disturbance in seeing, you know, relatively minor problems, and if I, if I go to the self-help group, and half of the members are sitting in wheelchairs, that's quite shocking, yeah. right? So it's good if the person in the clearinghouse told me in advance, be aware, if you go there, there will be people with more severe situations. Uh, make your choice if you think, no, I don't want to be confronted. Or if you say, oh yes, it's wise to, in an early stage, to see which road it can go and to be prepared. You know, that kind, we call it intermediate structure, something between, something guiding me, something signposting. That is a nice word, you know, signposting, signposting giving me opportunities. You can go to Paris or to Rome, make your decision, right? That's what the signpost says. But also a kind of consultation to make my own decision. You know, in medicine, they talk about shared decision making, right? It's not only you, the doctor, who knows best. You know a lot about my disease, but you don't know what my preference is in which way I want to be treated. For example, if I suffer from a depression, do I prefer psychotherapy? Do I prefer pharmacotherapy? Maybe you advise me to do both. Maybe I say no chemistry, and you say, but you know there's evidence, etc. etc. That kind of decision making before I make my decision to join a self help group or not. Well, I come back to your question. I said we have three elements in self help groups, organization, centers, and we have 300, roughly speaking, of these centers, which means there is one center in every major city or and or in every district. So that every German has relatively easy access to one of these centers to collect information to get help. Okay. Can you tell us something about the, the growth of the self-help groups? Nowadays. Nowadays. Yeah. Because you, you, you said that there are about uh, 100,000 yes. groups. Yeah. And you mean growth in number? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, I think the growth that we had over all these years and decades is possibly coming to an end. There are groups dying, which is a natural process. There are new groups coming in especially in the field of psychological problems. Depression is a very important thing, rising, etc. And groups for rare diseases. These are the, the main growing sectors, so to speak. Whereas for cancer, for alcoholism, the market is satisfied. There are enough groups. People are going in, going out. It's a kind of, uh, <coughs> of balance, you know. So I don't is expect a, a much more growth. I think it's, it's, it's a stable system. I'm sorry, but I would like to go back to the previous question. You said 
that from the radical and uh, revolutionary groups of the 70s, they became a mainstream uh, 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 situation for the middle Germany. Uh, what do you mean? And uh, I remember the, the presentation of Professor Kofar back in uh, 2009 in Berlin. He was saying he, he made a historical uh, review and in his presentation, if I remember correctly, there was a lot of discussion about these movements arising after the May of 68, etc. Yes. I, I would like a comment there. Yes, uh, yes. Um, of course, I do not know if in Greece the term 68 has the same connotation. Probably uh, not, because we had a dictatorship <laughs> back <yes>. then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why I perhaps should uh, briefly explain. 1968 was the year of the students' rebellion in Germany. Um, we don't have the time now to go into details, but it was fueled and, and um, inspired by three factors. One factor was uh, the Vietnam War, like everywhere in the world. Um, the second thing was a fight between generations, the upcoming youth culture, you know, long hair, Jimi Hendrix music <laughs> and that kind of thing, and hippie behavior and uh, drug use uh, started and all this. And the special thing in Germany was it was triggered by the conflict of generations. Mm -hmm. There was silence about the war and about the Holocaust and etc., the Shoah. And this young generation of the 68s, these young students started not only to ask their fathers, but to accuse their fathers. And they did not only accuse their fathers in person, but their fathers representing the system. Mm -hmm. So there were all kinds of questions to all parts of the system. How is school working? What about the, the relationship between teachers and uh, students or pupils? The gender question, what is the behavior between men and women? Uh, in universities, what is the relationship between uh, professors and students? And this basic stream of post-68, after-68, that also reached, with a little delay, the field of health. Because the health system, hospitals, etc., the doctors' association, that is very conservative everywhere in the world. And so all of a sudden we started to ask, what is the relationship between the demigod in white <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the patient, right? And is this relation given by the Lord? <coughs> Or is that a <coughs> cultural phenomenon, which we can question? Right. So, uh, the, the whole society in Germany, there was a fresh wind. It was far from being a revolution, but a fresh wind. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. Everything changed. And I think that the self-help movement in Germany is a child of this development. And allow me a, a more personal question regarding the first things that we have said. This fresh wind, that uh, the self help movement was a product of this uh, situation, played a role in your choice, not uh, of starting working with self help groups, but staying all these years, because it was by chance the first encounter, <coughs> but all the other route was a choice. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that is so. Uh, I don't want to use too much time on my personal history, but... Uh, <laughs> we would like to. So, okay, like, okay. Uh, so in 1977 it was a kind of coincidence. I mean, it was not total coincidence. Professor Möller could have asked somebody else. Yeah, okay. I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. So. <laughs> right. Ten years later, yeah. self-help in Germany had progressed a little bit through our project because we 
produced the results not only in scientific journals, which nobody reads, but also in talk, TV talk shows, in yellow press newspapers, in everyday newspapers, etc., radio programs, so that the public could learn something and might be inspired. And ten years later, 1987, our government, the federal government, had heard about these self-help things and were thinking if that could be useful for Germany as a state. And they were going around asking what can we do as the federal government. That's not such an easy question in Germany because social and health matters do not belong to the national level but to the federal state level. So what I suggested to the federal government to do what we call a program of demonstration models, which means you try something out. And that's what the federal government is allowed to do in case the federal state say okay. Now the argument of the federal government is, listen, dear state, dear state, I have the idea to do something and I am ready to pay for it. Would you allow me to do that? Half of the federal states said, oh, well, yeah, go ahead, <laughs> that's fine. The others said, no, we are not interested. So this scheme of demonstration models took place only in a number of uh, federal states. And it was publicly announced. Everybody was able to send an application. I did send an application. I was no longer in the, in the self-help field but still connected to the topic, obviously, I sent an application. The application was accepted. There were 18 out of 300, 300 applications. And this was a crossroad of my professional life. I had to decide whether I look for a talented young professional to do the job, or whether I find myself talented enough and young enough to do it myself. Yeah. And I always call this a kind of relapse because I was so fascinated from the research days about what ordinary people can do. Yeah. Not all of them, some of them. Yeah. That was deeply impressing me. So 10 years later I said, okay, I do it myself. And since then, I'm addicted to that, and what yeah, you started there's the work, no cure. And you started the work you listen. Yes, that's right. And still today, coming from this tradition out of the research project, still today our clearinghouse is placed in the university hospital. Mm. It is an independent body. We are not financed through the university. We have other sources of finance but we are still in this context. Sometimes I say it's embedded, if you understand this term. Yeah. Like some journalists are embedded in armies, when the armies go to Iraq. But this is a peaceful uh, form of being embedded, mm -hmm. which has enormous advances, because just next door are a number of specialists that I can consult. Mm -hmm. I have access to the university library online, I can read practically every journal in the world, you know, which no other clearinghouse can. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very privileged situation. And it makes it easier for me, not easy, but easier for me, to uh, have contact to professionals, to professional organizations. So I'm invited to speak to doctors and nurses and midwives, etc., always caring half the label of self-help and half the label of university. It's a kind of hybrid situation. You know what hybrid means? Half driven by petrol, half driven by electricity, you know? <laughs> switching from one to the other, using useful labels in different contexts. So, it was, it was not by chance. <laughs> uh, no. uh, there are a lot of things that we would like to ask about 
the project in case of how many people work there, but let us stay to the more general things. Um, let me take you to another area. There is a lot of discussion in uh, international bibliography regarding the terms. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, first question that I have is probably you prefer the term self help group. Although this last decade, last two decades, if I'm not mistaken, especially the Americans use the term self help and mutual aid, mm -hmm. not mutual help group. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment about yes. it? Yes. Because words matter. <laughs> words matter, I'm absolutely on your side. Um, Actually, I would love to use this double term. Yeah. It's only unpractical in German, yeah. right? But uh, very often, if I don't forget it, always, <laughs> I mention mutual aid as the most important mechanism in self-help groups. Mm -hmm. I love the term self-help groups because it has three elements, <laughs> as you can easily see. It means it is about myself. It's not about helping you because I am a Samaritan, I'm yeah. such a good person. Like voluntary work. Mm -hmm. Voluntary yeah. work is fine, but it's something different. It's about me. There's an egoistic element in it. Right? Secondly, there's help, which means I need help. That is for sure. Right? If I have the feeling I don't need help, then I stay at home. Then I have no motivation. You know it best from the field of alcoholism. You know, yeah. The person who drinks too much is the last who understands that he needs help. Right? The family knows first. The, fam the, the, uh, the wife, the employer, the neighbors, everybody knows. But the point is when I say I need help, that's the start of self. And the third element is group, which means we are not talking about individual self-help. Individual self-help, that's the way human beings survive. You feel thirsty, you, you have some water. You feel hungry, you eat a sandwich. You have a headache, you go to the pharmacy and buy aspirin. That's self-help, okay, that's all. Okay. But we do it in groups. So I always say, if I give a presentation, if I use the term self-help, that's only a short version. I'm talking about self-help groups. And mutual aid, that is the most important character which makes a difference between self-help groups and other forms of group work. There are lots of other forms, from psychotherapy to patient education to uh, teaching relaxation techniques, um, adult education schemes, that's all done in groups. Yeah. But it's always the classical um, pattern. One is in the front, the teacher, the therapist, and the others are the pupils, the children, the patients. Right. And here it's mutuality. You help me, I help you. Perhaps not in the same session, but in the long run. Today I try and you give me a hug, next time it's done. Therefore, by the, way, by the way, veterans are so important. People who have a long experience, they are my older brothers and sisters when I join the group, so I have some orientation, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. that did work, that did not work. And then after some time in the process, for the first time I have the experience there are others I can help. I change role from somebody seeking help to somebody giving help. And as you know, Frank Riesman in America coined mm. the wonderful term of the, self, uh, of the helper therapy principle, which means giving help is a very healing process. And so it's a kind of dialectic relationship between two roles which come together in one person. Partly I'm a patient and partly I'm a co-therapist. So that's the key element. Mutual aid is the key element in self-help groups. Yeah.
Thank you. Uh, and uh, I have uh, noted here to ask you which are the milestones as far as positive developments in the field of social support uh, the last 30, 35 years in your opinion. But I'm not sure that we are talking on self-help support for the whole field. Self-help groups, self-help support. Let us stay to self-help support. Mm. Well, what are the milestones? I think that is very different in various countries. Yeah. It is let's start from uh, your own country. Right? From my own country, which is yeah. Germany, yes. <clears throat> I think... The, f the first step was that in this early research project, 1977, mm. it was a kind of side product that we developed something which we would now call a self-help clearinghouse or self-help contact center, whatever. That was not the plan. It came out of the practice of research because it was a kind of action research so we were not only collecting data, but we are trying out things. People came to us, could you help me to do this and this? Uh, could you, could you uh, write down some, some rules, some advice, etc. No. So we were a contact center before the word, because the, before the word, the <laughs> word was there. Yeah. Right, okay. So the second step was, uh, what I mentioned 10 years later, 87, it was the government who said, well, that might be an interesting approach. For whatever reason, I personally think it was for mixed reasons. There was a desire for more democracy. And there was also the hope to save money and the hope to, um, to offer another additional help system or however you call that. So for the first time there was some recognition through the government that might be something helpful. We had research done on this demonstration project, etc. And the result of this research was that we had more self-help groups, more members and more stability in their work. So from then on we could say Dear politicians, if you think that is something good, we tell you what you have to do if you want to have this to be improved. The next step was that our government tried to find a way to support self-help in terms of money, all the three pieces of the cake, groups, organizations, mm -hmm clearinghouses, contact centers, and they made a decision that our health insurances, which are statutory health insurances, which means practically everybody has to be a member, it's not a private business, they are not profit-making. Um, the state said these health insurances, they should give money to it. And they did it by law. So since then, now I'm talking about the, the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, it was clear that the government said that is something of value for our population and money has to be invested. This sum of money is growing and today it is 45 million euro, which come from this source of the health insurances and goes to very complicated channels mm -hmm. to the three elements of uh, self-help. So the financial support and the acceptance by the state. Mm -hmm. It's always important for me to say it's not only about money. Yeah, of course. The money comes because it's recognized and accepted. Right? And the last step I would say is that coming from a different direction, we have the term of patient participation in Germany. Mm. And the government made a decision, we want to have patient participations, and then when they are looking for who is the patient, 
who can represent the patient best, because everybody is a patient now and then, we offered the self-help structures in Germany as being the best, if not a perfect, but the best representation of patients and patients' interests. So many of the seats which are given to patients or patient representatives in various committees are now taken by self-helpers. Self-helpers means people coming from self-help groups or self-help organizations or self-help centers. And this step means that we do not any longer only deal with ourselves and our diseases and coping mechanisms for our diseases, etc. But we can influence the system as such. Now we are in decision-making bodies. Yeah, that's a great milestone. Yeah. And uh, regarding other countries or uh, the Europe, uh, the European continent, if you could give us an yeah. idea. Yeah in how far the developments yeah. are similar or different? Yeah. That, that's your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's European diversity. <laughs> we, As we have experienced these last days. Yes. Um, to put it very simple and making a joke, I'm not promoting alcohol, but as a joke, <laughs> as a joke, it's easy to find self-help in beer drinking countries. It's a bit more difficult to find it in wine drinking countries. <laughs> and you don't find it in vodka drinking countries. <laughs> okay. Of course, that has not to do with the drinking habits, yeah. but with national traditions, religious traditions, yeah. uh, the, the way the health systems are organized. Is it state-run? Is it done by health insurances as well? So, what I want to say with this joke, you find a well-elaborated, comparatively well-elaborated systems in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, so the German-speaking tradition. You find it in the northern countries, which is Scandinavia plus Finland. You find some bits in England. There's not much in France, Spain, Portugal. Since a couple of years we have isolated things in Italy. We have this one and now four projects in Greece. <laughs> Congratulations to the growth. Mm -hmm. So in, in growth, I think you are the best. <laughs> in growth. Um, there's not much going on in the former communist mm -hmm. countries because there it's not a tradition. Everything was forbidden. Everything outside the party system was forbidden, mm -hmm. right? Because the party made sure that everything is perfect, yeah. right? There was no alcoholism in Hungary. There were no suicides in Hungary, right? Mm -hmm. right. So only slowly we are developing what we call a civic society. The mentality that the individual person, the citizen, can do something, should do something, together with others, outside the state system, outside the church system, outside big traditional organizations. And this mentality is not the same in all these countries. And comparing to the United States? Well, I think there are two main differences between the United States and large parts of Europe. One is they don't have any kind of social welfare state, which means the idea is you are your own master. Try your luck with a little help of the Lord and if you are good enough then you become a millionaire <laughs> and if you're not you wash the dishes. Yeah. So that is American mentality, and in such a country you can only survive if you are active and if you struggle, individually or collectively. Um, 
so to put it in a joke, they have no choice. They have to self-help. <laughs> yeah. right. yeah. well, the second thing is that America is a much more religious society. Mm -hmm. For me, coming from a very secular society, it is unbelievable uh, the influence of various church groups in America. And it is not like in Germany where we have two big churches, Catholic and Protestant. It's not like in Greece where you have one 100% church. Or in Sweden they have a 100% church which is Protestant. In America you have the Catholic Church and then you have a large number of churches which sometimes behave like businesses and they have this old Protestant tradition of confession to the congregation. Right? So you go, you, you confess your sins to the congregation and then it's the question if they exclude you or if they say you are forgiven if you do this and this and this and this and this. So again we have this element of self-responsibility but also the element of being connected to a congregation which is a kind of group and it's not a very big thing but it's a local thing, right? And uh, this tradition of confession is in the 12 steps groups, yes. etc., etc., etc. That's why the two step groups are so expanded. Yeah. The yes, they, they fit perfectly yes. to these American uh, traditions. So I guess uh, self help and self help groups and things are everywhere. Many are church based or whatever. They also, of course, have these big lobbying uh, self help organizations. I do not know how close they are to the pharmaceutical industry. I do not know, but uh, the fact that I mention it uh, gives you a tiny little sign. We come to this issue later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as we have just heard in, in this conference we had, that unfortunately the, the number of clearing houses or contact centers is going down and that has to do with the economic situation and with private business things and lack of social state, social welfare state uh, ideas etc. So um, my conclusion is I'm a bit sad about the US um, and what I've learned here is we should no longer look at them as being a, a model to follow. Mm -hmm. Let's do our European job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, were there any negative developments in the field in the last 30, 35 years in Zagreb? Yes, it was. Um, perhaps not negative, but uh, new risks or new questions or challenges. Um, there are two that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. One is the question of uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned the pharmaceutical industry. And, uh, for example, in Germany it is like that. Uh, in earlier days, the pharmaceutical industry was corrupting the doctors to a high degree. Uh, in various ways, and usually the doctors did not even notice it. So I'm not blaming the doctors, I'm blaming the system. And we have interesting pieces of research that doctors were interviewed or asked by questionnaires whether they take money from the industry, money or products or other kinds of gifts. They were asked if they feel to be influenced by these gifts and they were asked if they think that their colleagues are influenced. And the answer was, I am not influenced, but I guess my colleagues are. <laughs> right? That's the same like asking people if they think that their driving capabilities are above average. And 80% say my driving abilities are above average. Now you being psychologists, you know that statistically that cannot be correct. <laughs> okay, so 
Um, that this is a, a brutal or obvious form of production if when self-help groups or self-help organizations take money from the industry and even without being aware follow their instructions, wishes, whatever, right? But it's not only money, you can also be corrupted by politicians, yeah. right? If a government gives you money and this government is connected to a certain party, then you don't longer criticize this party, perhaps. You know? uh, so there are all kinds of influences. What we have to learn, to sum it up, we have to learn that we self-helpers can also have conflicts of interests. Yeah. Right? So that is one new topic that we have to discuss in Germany, and we do quite um, lively. <laughs> The second danger I see is what I call overstretch. Overstretch is a term that you might use for big empires like the Roman Empire or the British Empire. They became bigger and bigger and bigger, which means the borders become longer and longer and longer. And at a certain time you don't have the troops to defend your borders any longer. And the colonies become more and more expensive. You can't import so much uh, chocolate and rice and uh, cotton from the colonies. Ah, okay, so it was simply too big, and then they failed. And the same can happen to self-help as a side effect of the positive recognition. We are in Germany, being comparatively advanced, we have reached that point that, for example, we are, we are invited to participate in many, many meetings, boards, councils, advisory things, you know. I could spend my whole week sitting in these things, you know. And many self-helpers are ready to follow such an invitation because they feel honored and recognized. That's what we always wanted, to be heard, right? Now they invite me, of course I go. After some time, you realize it's only a token, you know, it's only a fig leaf. You don't have any influence. You just sit there that they can say we even have patient participation. We had a self-helper with us, we are great. So that is kind of overstretch. Also, the second kind of overstretch is that society, state, municipality, whoever, hospital, comes to you and says, listen, we have a problem here, could you help us to save it, you know, to, to solve it, to solve it. Uh, we have immigrants, we have uh, dementia, uh, we have uh, drug addicts, you know, all kinds of problems, you know, and Please, and to sum this up, I think self-help has to learn at a certain point in history, in development, to say no. Thank you for the offer, but that is simply too much. We are only a small group. We are disabled people, don't forget that. No, we have our weaknesses, we cannot work. Perhaps we, we, perhaps we even have retired from job because of our disease. Now, don't ask too much from us, right? So, um, to find out what can we do without burning out and to help our partners to understand our potentials are limited. It's very nice that you recognize us. It's very nice that you trust in our abilities and capabilities but they are limited. So you think that the, the answer to that is to, to redefine what the basic needs are and throw away <laughs> stuff that don't matter? Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Make priorities. Yes. What is important? What pays off for us? Be egoistic as a group, right? 
Um, I'll give you one example. In Germany, some cancer groups uh, do something uh, what, we, what I call bedside visit, which means a new person is delivered to the hospital for a cancer operation, let it be breast cancer, prostate cancer, whatever, and uh, they can ask for somebody from the self-help group to come in to talk to them, which is of course very helpful, you know, because the doctor says, don't worry, it's a routine operation, we do it every day, yes, but I don't do it every day, <laughs> I'm terribly frightened, you know, can I survive, yeah. what does it mean, you know, for a woman, the breast is taken away, things like that. So it's very helpful if somebody comes and says, I know exactly what you feel, I've gone through this, we discussed this in our group, etc., etc., that's very helpful. But if you see it from the other perspective, that is a task or an obligation that this group is accepting because they have to promise the hospital whenever somebody from your patients calls us, we will send somebody. Maybe in a certain, there are only one or two or three who do it for the group, group members who volunteer to do this service, right? And at a certain point in time, they are burnt out. They have their own relapse. The, the disease comes back, they have their own uh, cancer problems, whatever. They are tired of it, uh, they don't, f well, for whatever reason. Then the group should say, sorry, dear hospital, for the next time we are not able to do this. And they should not feel ashamed or whatever, that's the way, that's the way. Maybe, maybe in a year or so when we have new members, then we mm -hmm. will contact you and then we can offer this service again. But at time being, it's too much. Are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. Are we, are we tired? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, let us go to some specific things. Although some of them were discussed already, we have uh, noted here a question regarding uh, your opinion about the most important features of a self-help mutual aid group. Which are the key features of certain groups? You already mentioned mutuality. Yes. Uh, and some other things. Would you like to add some? Why is a self help group self? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a very complex uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. Because it's too simple. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it help? How does it help? Um, what I always hear from participants in self help groups is that they say the first thing is to learn that I'm not the only one. Yeah. You know, I walked through my life, uh, I caught this disease, be it cancer or addiction, and I thought I'm the only one. Dear Lord, why did you leave me alone? You know? And in the group I see I'm not the only one. That's amazing. Um, so, um, out of uh, the situation of an outsider, I'm mainstream. In the group, it is normal to suffer from cancer. It is normal to be an alcoholic. Wow, okay. So, that's a little bit an island. Uh, the second element is, people always refer to, is the understanding. If I tell you my story, I, I, I try to explain and to explain and to explain, like I explain to my friends and to, to my sister, and I explain and I explain. And very early you say, you don't have to talk so much. I know, I know what you're talking about, okay? Because I'm in the same situation, or I was in the same situation. So that kind of understanding, immediate, or quick or easy understanding. That's also a very, very deep impression. Uh, the kind of support you receive, which is close to understanding. The third element is 
what the psychologists uh, call learning from models. Right? Rats learn from rewards. You know, they go there, they get a food, some food, and then they go come again. Human beings learn from models. Children look the way their patients behave. Sometimes we are bad models. For example, an English friend of mine once said, don't do what I do, do what I say. <laughs> so we do not always behave as a positive model. But in the self-help group, we think, we hope, we are, sometimes we observe, that is a bunch of models, like a bunch of flowers, you know, and these flowers are not absolutely alike, you know, you are a tulip, you are a rose, and uh, I think, ah, that's interesting, but at this point, his solution is better, I would never do what you've done, you know? so it helps me to compare, comparison is a is a very important mechanism. Comparison is not rivalry, it's not, it's not competition. Comparison is, ah, okay, I'm different. Um, you, you play much better football than I do, so I should uh, train a, bit, a little bit more, or whatever it is. You know? So to, to compare with the others, to learn from their experiences, to think, well, that's the way. Again, that refers to the veterans because the veterans obviously were successful in, in whatever they do. Um, well, perhaps the, yeah, perhaps the number four would be uh, information. Uh, until now I was talking about relationship and emotional things, now I'm talking about the hard stuff, which is information. Simple question, I was just diagnosed with rheumatism, there are 30 doctors in Gießen who are internists. Now you tell me in the group which of these 50, 30 internists does really know about rheumatism. Yeah. Yeah. Some know about cardiology or things. Yeah. Okay. Second question, if you have been to that guy that you recommend, what is his way of treating persons? because I'm not only a rheumatic, I'm also a person, right? Um, in German language, or maybe in English as well, yeah, in English as well, treatment, to treat, means what the doctor does to the patient, but there's also the way I'm treating you, you are treating me, it, it has a double meaning, right? Yeah. And that is a well-known phrase from a German cancer group, uh, the doctors know better how to treat us as patients, but we know better how we want to be treated as human beings. Okay, change of perspective. Yeah. The doctor is not wrongdoing. He's not wrongdoing. Yeah. But I, we, we have a different perspective, <laughs> and to bring this into the treatment that is useful. Mm. By the way, it's useful for both although the doctor does not yet understand. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so I want to say about this information. What, what treatment alternatives are there? What are my legal rights, for example? In, in Germany, it would be the question of, um, we call it kind of passport of being diseased, uh, of being disabled, of being disabled, you know. Uh, is it useful to have such a passport? Yes, it is useful because you have tax reduction or whatever, or special parking places or whatever. But mind, it gives you a self-image. Do you want to have a self-image of being a disabled person? You know, that's very helpful. I make up my business. Actually, I did not, did not know that this exists. Thank you for the information. But also about shared decision making, etc. So information is very important, especially in the field of somatic medicine. Mm. In alcoholism, it's not a question of information, right? Yeah. Because everybody knows that it's not good to drink too much. <laughs> and uh, what about social networking around groups? Is it helpful? Around? 
around the group. When, when I enter a group, yeah. I meet a lot of people. Yeah. I make a new social network. Absolutely. I mean, in, in social psychology, we have a growing literature, mm -hmm. and also in clinical psychology, we have a growing literature about the benefits of social networks. Um, to put it simple, um, to smoke is less dangerous than to be lonely. Loneliness is a risk factor. If you ask people, do you know risk factors? Oh yes, no smoking, less drinking, less fat eating, more uh, emotion, right? Okay. They always forget the most important risk factor, and that is loneliness. Mm -hmm. And there are hard data, we have hard data, that people, for example, recover more quickly from accidents and from illnesses, etc. Uh, well, that's about psychosomatic medicine, how You're mental right. things and somatic things interact in both directions by the way. So any kind of network is positive for your health. It is also positive for society, but that's another thing. And I always say, Self-help groups are a kind of artificial network. It is artificial, you know. I go there in a certain situation. In the beginning, I have no reason to talk to you and to talk to you. I don't know you. Mm -hmm. It's only because we share common. a disability or a, a common, 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 common problem, issue. right? Okay. So through this, we construct a new social network. And that becomes more and more important in societies where the traditional networks like family, church, uh, village, you know, disappear more and more. And Germany is a very good example, which means a bad example. We don't have extended families anymore. People, young people, go out of their families because they have to go to a university or to a place where they find a job, etc. There are no more grandmothers, mm. right? They are still alive, but they are 500 kilometers away, right? So if I need support with my child, there must be something else, which is an artificial thing, like a self help group. So this networking, or, yeah, if you call it that way, that's a very, very important uh, yeah. element. And uh, what about um, the freedom of um, self-determination and that I define, I, the self-definition of what uh, do I have and how to, to manage with it? About self-help groups, the, mm -hmm. the features, the, the, the elements. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by freedom of definition? Self-determination. Uh, in addition, in, 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 um, uh, on the contrary of, uh, of uh, the diagnosis of the doctors, or the, 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 the authority of the doctors, <coughs> I mean. My personal theory of my illness. Yes. Yeah, yes. And the freedom to yeah. define myself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, What well, we know from, from research that this is a very important thing, what the patient himself thinks about his disease and the origins, right? And every patient has his personal theory. For example, if I uh, suffer from cancer, uh, that can be a punishment from the Lord, it can be consequence of my lifestyle, I smoke too much. It can be just by chance, 10 out of 30. Okay. And that has consequences to my feeling of responsibility to do something about it. Um, if, if the Lord is the key, I may even refuse to, to use medicine. There are some radical 
religious groups who say uh, we don't accept uh, blood uh, transfusions, yeah. or how do you call that? Yeah. Yeah. Or um, uh, I don't accept um, organ transplants or whatever, you know? Or vaccines. Yes, I refuse to, to uh, vaccination of my children and things like that. So it has enormous consequences. And the key point for me, I'm not sure if I understood your question correct, the key point for me is the question, how much responsibility do I take mm. for the management or the coping with my disease? That is obvious in the case of alcoholism or, or other addictions because there is no pill against it and nobody else can do something about it. There's no operation, nothing. The only thing is I stop drinking. I mean, you can help me, you can support me, but, but I have to do it. That, that's it. But also in the case of, of uh, cancer, I, I love to use or I usually use cancer as an example. The treatment, of course, that's the question of the professionals. I, I do not discuss operations and, and uh, medications with them. They, they have to do it. But still it is the question, how do I deal with this illness? How do I communicate with my family? Do I go to my employer and say, now I'm, I'm ill, I can't work any longer, and I go for a pension, for retirement? Or do I go to my employer and say, listen, I'm, I'm very tired because of my disease. They call it fatigue. There's even a scientific term for that. It's not my personal problem. But I would like to go on working perhaps two hours a day. Can we find a solution? You know, that's a different thing. Or how you communicate in your in your networks, right? Do you tell everybody I suffer from cancer? Do you tell nobody? Don't tell anybody. You know. By the way, I once had a, an interview with a cancer group. It's quite some years ago, and I said, um, "How did you find the group, etc.?" Blah blah blah, and. Um, I said, what about church, what about neighborhood? And they said, our neighbors must not know that we suffer from cancer. I said, why not? Because they would not allow their children to play with my children. Because of infection. Right? Of course we laugh about that, right? But it is reality. That's a personal theory of a disease. It, it's absolute nonsense, but it works. Is that partly an answer to your question? No, I was talking about the responsibility thing. Yeah. And, but you mentioned some dangers that uh, are hidden in this mm -hmm. idea. Every conversation with you is <laughs> very interesting for me. And uh, I can help you. I will ask Green Life previously that uh, the social networking is a good thing for the group members, but probably or might be a good thing about the whole society to have active uh, corners of, of active citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm asking about uh, or whether there is a political uh, aspect of certain groups. Yes. Um, in modern society, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I always have to give spontaneous uh, answers here. You know, I have no chance to to, to research on that, yeah. or to, to even to collect my my thoughts. But spontaneously, yeah. I would say two things. One is, it is a kind of training ground for democratic behavior. Training? Training ground, yeah. training yeah. field, yeah. 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 right, okay. Because uh, we are a number of people here. Mm. Our, uh, our opinions vary, they are not equal. And we, ha we have to find a compromise, right? Either your position is a minority and you have to accept 
that we do not follow your proposal, mm -hmm. or we have to say you are a minority, but we will not forget you. It will not be the first thing we discuss, but, but do remind us, we, we will come to that point, for example. Or some people say, if we have some kind of leadership in the group, it should be revolving, you know. You are the leader for the next 10 sessions, and then Sotiris will take the next uh, 10, and then I will volunteer whatever leadership means, perhaps only to say, now it's your turn, now it's your turn. So, this revolving system, for example, would clearly document and be a symbol that we are equally able to do that. We are not equal, not at all, but we are equally able to do that, like we are equal in front of the law. Like we are equal, equal in giving votes at the election, right? Here we are equal. Apart from that, we are completely different. Which is very productive for groups. Because one speaks English, one speaks French, one speaks... Don't know what? Languages as a symbol, you know? Everybody has to configure it. And it's a theoretical picture that I have and that I use. If if you put all our personalities on top and if they are transparent, so you, you can look through and be combined, we find that if it, somebody has some competency in every area, if you understand my before my okay, so the combination of the health producing elements, the combination that of all of the participants, that is the equivalent of a therapist. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. I'm in German, I'm better in explaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the uh, society consequences. First of all, we have people who learn and practice yeah. some form of democracy. So the whole thing that goes back to 68, <laughs> and it goes back to the various mentalities of more authoritarian, more liberal, etc. Uh, things. And the second um, consequence for society is that if self help progresses to what I have explained for him, uh, what I explained earlier, to a state where self helpers are representatives in committees, etc. Then they start to influence decision in the society. They become players, they become shareholders. Uh, that may have side effects, right? But in a society where a number of groups, pressure groups, industries, political parties, uh, social welfare organizations, churches, etc., they all try to influence and the self-help movement can provide some people representing the interests of patients, sufferers, etc. It is one amount of questions remains. Let us go to ask, to self-helpers. What do you think that uh, are the key features of a self-help support? If, uh, or as Alexandros told me earlier, what do you think are the basic steps, steps for a new social science, for example, to, to get into the field? Mm. What we need? Okay. Uh, it's not bad to read. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because we all stand on earlier generations, right? Even those who invented the wheel, there, there were people before who had the idea of wheels. Yeah. Uh, so reading means to, to learn about uh, what, what older people, earlier generations, have written down as their experience, uh, etc. Et Second thing is to participate in self-help groups. 
that's always a good thing, you know. If you want to become a psychotherapist, at least in Germany, that is part of the education and the training that you sit on the patient's chair for a while, you know, uh, to learn a bit more about your own personality before you start to treat uh, other persons in a psychotherapeutic way. And the third element is to join a network, if possible, of colleagues, perhaps some older colleagues, if possible, uh, to reflect your ideas. In other contexts we would call it supervision. Right. Okay. Um, we had in this conference the, a wonderful example from your young mm. colleague uh, who was switching between the roles of a professional, a patient, somebody promoting self-help, etc. And I had a fantasy, this poor lady, she's on her own. I know she's connected with you. Yeah. You know, that is very important to, to understand what have I done. Uh, for example, you, you could go, if, if you have a self-help meeting of whatever kind, if it is possible, go there with two persons, with a colleague, so that afterwards you can have a glass of Greek wine and say, have you seen that? Why did you say that? Why did you say nothing in this situation? Well, I did say nothing because dun 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 dun. Or why should I have said something? You know, and that is a very that's my my perfect way of further education. Yes, I think you're totally right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Would you like to spare some time to discuss for some dangers regarding self help groups? Dangers or uh, risky conditions. Yes. Such as you have uh, written some things. Yeah. Uh, may I firstly add something to my last yeah, uh, of course, comment? Of course. Um, I react to the word danger because in our activities as self help supporters, mm -hmm. There's also the danger of yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, I think the main danger is that we do not fi find the right balance between um, not offering enough help, information, support, coordination, whatever, because we want. We don't want to touch them too much and they should be independent, etc. That could lead to an abstinence, which in reality means uh, not giving what they need. And the other pole, the other end of the spectrum is that we are over involved mm -hmm. and we become the group leader. Without saying that we are becoming the group leader, perhaps without seeing that we become, you know, then we use words like facilitator or I'm, I'm just with them, uh, you know, that kind of thing. That is all rubbish mm -hmm. um, and it has very often, it has to do with the fact that we are all that kind of helper personality because the helper therapy principle is definitely true for professional helpers. I mean, we have studied to become professional helpers mm -hmm. because we did know or we did guess that it's very good for ourselves. <laughs> right. Okay. That happens in self-help groups as well. But we, being professionals, we have a chance to control it. Only by dialogue. I cannot control it by myself. Only by dialogue. If we go together to start to help, help to start a group, words are not important here, 
And afterwards you tell me, oh, well, that was a bit too much. They, they, they could have done without that. Okay. And especially if they say, oh, that was very good. And please, Mr. Matza, could you come next time? Then it's up to you to say, say no, say no, say no. Why? Yeah. So that is, that's the art of self-help support, you know, that's not something you find in studies, you know, that's uh, like good doctors, you know, uh, they're all equal in their knowledge, but some have the, the, the touch, okay. So the danger is that we either do too much or not enough, and that's very difficult to define. I cannot define that in abstract terms, it's a question for every single case. Yeah, mm -hmm. it depends on the experience, it yes. is the reflection. Uh, self -help support like that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm. So, would you like to, to discuss now for some dangers or limits? Uh, dangers, in my opinion, mm. that self help groups yeah. have, have, have written yeah. some things about professionalization or, yes. or even commercialization of uh, this. Yes, examples. yes, okay. Um, these are two key words that, that's right. I mean, one thing is that they become too professional. Yeah. That the term professionalization of self help uh, that's absurd okay. in itself, right? Yeah. Quite often, self helpers, self help groups are confronted from others who say, You should become more professional. If you want to be accepted, please, you know, follow the rules. In some way, we should do, but stop in the moment when you lose. The, char the characteristics of the self help group uh, and delivering services. I spoke about that earlier. You want to think about that. Uh, commercial aspects. I mean, that should be clear. Self help. That's not commercial. I mean, that's that's clear. It's, it's impossible that people have to pay for that. What I can do myself, I don't pay. Right. Okay. Um, of course. It might be necessary to give a contribution, for example, if a group has to pay for a room, then we have to share that and everybody has to give a euro or two to, to pay for the room. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I think one danger is that the expectancies are too high, that people come to groups and think, I will find the solution they will tell me what to do. It's wise from the beginning to say, no, no, that's not the way. We offer a chance to participate in our activities. That's what we offer, not, not the solution of your problems, but you can participate in, in a common process of mutual aid. Right? Uh, for example, if the groups are constructed like this, that a new person should first have a telephone conversation with the group leader before the person can join the group. Some groups do it. It, it makes sense. But I always tell these group leaders, you better don't answer the questions that this new person has on the phone. Because if you do this, this person will not come to the group. Right? Tell them that's a very interesting question. When can, we can discuss about this question next Tuesday if you come to the group, right? Then, then the motivation is there. I think the the greatest danger. I think the, the da there are not so many dangers, but the greatest danger might be that some people do not go to proper treatment because they go to a self help group. Right. If, if they overestimate the efficiency of a group and therefore forget to go to proper treatment, that, that might be a side effect. This was even physical problems, physical health problems. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if, for example, if, if in the group there's more, uh, you better take alternative medicine, that kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think that uh, came to my mind these last days, it came into my mind again, 
Uh, it's last day is the meeting. Is that uh, sometimes I feel that uh, uh, as the self help supporters have a great anxiety for for the future and uh, uh, talk too much about the project, about uh, the best tool, the best practices. And in a way, we uh, we have a tool oriented view on uh, self help groups. And, uh, we try to adapt this philosophy to the mainstream uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, the conversation that uh, we had about self-management, mm -hmm. a new term. And you said that uh, such terms come and go every five or ten years. And uh, we have an excited sometimes to, to include this term, to self-help, in order not to lose money, not to lose the legitimization, whatever. A bureaucrat in Brussels or whoever in the Health Commission uh, thought uh, of it. Mm. And uh, in a way, self help follows it, not directs uh, the situation. Yes, that's sometimes like the carrot which is in front of the animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah so. um, yes, I agree uh, that uh, I am. Generally, I say, don't panic, don't panic, <laughs> that will come and go, you know. It's like fashion, I mean, ladies always have a problem to wear the, the newest fashion and mm -hmm. my recommendation is put it in the cupboard and bring it back in 10 years and then it will be absolutely fashionable. Um, well, uh, sometimes I would say simply ignore it. Sometimes I would say, discuss about it if there possibly are elements which are useful indeed. I don't have a good example, but, but may, may, maybe, maybe even self-management. Look into it, what does it exactly mean, check it, if it is a useful approach or not. Uh, but don't follow every fashion. Uh, of course, things change if this new fashion concept is connected with money. Yes. That, is, that is an interesting point. And I have the experience that in some cases, both self-help organizations and self-help centers, I'm not talking about self-help groups, but self-help organizations and self-help centers in Germany sometimes do things which are amazing nonsense mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. personal yeah, yeah, yeah. innocent eyes <laughs> <laughs> can you and, give us an example and and if i have the courage or the motivation to discuss that with them usually i don't because <laughs> i'm a polite person <laughs> It, it doesn't take long until they say, well, that's what we get money for. Mm -hmm. If we do what we want, or if we do what we think is appropriate, that is not bringing the money. So we have to do this. Yeah, I'll give you an, uh, an example. Um, there was a political fashion to do something about the youngsters. I have forgotten what triggered that. Maybe because we don't have enough, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, suddenly some German self-helpers, all very nice people and intelligent and good-willing and everything, they start to do things to inform youngsters about self-help groups, which is total nonsense, because youngsters are healthy. <laughs> right. I'm not interested to learn anything about self-help group. If I'm healthy, you know, I want to learn how to, to meet a girl and things like that, and how, how to, to have a wonderful party, and uh, is Greece uh, cheaper than Turkey? That's mm -hmm. important information, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, but they did all kind and invest a lot of energy and manpower and there's not much manpower available, right? They invest in this. Second example is to work with ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, 
if they simply don't speak German, oh, what can you do about it? So the colleagues produce folders, leaflets in foreign languages, like I don't know what, Kiswahili or something, you know, speaking Somali. Now, what does that mean? First of all, the people from these far away cultures, they don't understand the word, even if the translation is correct. If the translation is correct, we cannot control it. <laughs> right? The, the translator, the interpreter, he or she wrote anything. If she's from down there, she doesn't know the concept of self-help group. Okay, anyway. Uh, now, imagine somebody from somewhere reads that. They don't read it, but if, in case he would read it, and then he calls the contact center. I mean, I don't speak this way. Really. <laughs> so that's the end of it. It, it, it leads to nowhere, yeah. right? It, it only shows we have produced these translations in 12 languages. Yeah. And somebody says, oh, well, that's good. That's a good activity. We have to do something for the immigrants. Here is the money. It's totally useless. Mm -hmm. But the money is there, <coughs> and you can produce something. Folders are always good because you can see them and give it to the Lord Mayor or to someone. These are examples. And of course, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. And please don't send the video to Germany. They are going to kill me. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, I have two more questions, but and I have one which is personal. Uh, personal. Personal. It came out of the, of the discussion. Should yeah. I? Yeah, of course. Because it's closing questions. Man. Yes, because I, um, I make a joke uh, often uh, to Sotiris, and I say that uh, self-help supporters, maybe we are uh, not talented uh, psychotherapists. That's why we. <laughs> Uh, we do uh, self-help. Uh, uh, you said something, um, this say no voice, you said before, say no, to go to the next meeting with, uh, with the person. Mm -hmm. with this say no voice, to have in control the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, accidental way you chose to operate as a professional, as you described, by accident, you said, uh, uh, does he have any political aspects concerning your uh, perspective of health? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Because I, I think it's very important, important mm -hmm. for us to, to, to have your opinion on this. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the beginning of the question, you spoke about the relationship between the profession of a self-help supporter and psychotherapy. And in the end you, you ended with health. I want to, to, to focus on the power that a therapist has. Yeah, okay. And a, a self-help supporter, maybe he's uh, not in the center, he's behind. Okay. So is this a, a, a choice that mm -hmm. he has political aspects mm. concerning your perspective about health in general? Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, um, um, reacting to your standard joke, <laughs> <laughs> um, when we started this in Germany, I was under the influence of the Department of Psychosomatic Medicine, Uh, my professor was a psychoanalyst, I was in uh, training as a uh, psychotherapist, etc. I had a very th psychotherapeutic view, which broadened over time, especially when I had more contact with self-help groups for somatic diseases. Mm -hmm. you know, they are not neurotic per se, mm -hmm. some of them are, because you can have a depression and cancer, Some show depression or anxiety reactions to cancer, so it's a very uh, complicated and interesting field. But it's a different thing uh, from a group where people come because of cancer, uh, because of uh, anxiety and depression. Um, 
In the beginning, we thought all the self-help supporters should have some kind of psychological education, training, things like that, on a low basis. Yeah. But not to misunderstand self-help support as pure information giving, right? Mm -hmm. That is the, the opposite for me, right? Uh, I give the information, here is the directory, you find out what you're used to, you know, that kind of thing. It's not an information, although information is very important, uh, self-approved support is some kind of clinical work. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't think it's clinical, it's clinical. Even if you're not a psychologist, it is psychological. Mm -hmm. right? um, so I think it's not bad if we have some experience in group work, being part of group, not a leader of group, but being part of a group, and to have at least some understanding of the unconscious, mm -hmm. right? and have um, a psychological approach to understand what people mean. One of my standard examples which I used during the conference is if somebody calls me in the self-help center and says I'm looking for a self-help group, for me that does not mean he's looking for a self-help group. For me it means he's looking for something let us find out if that is a self-help group. Because basically he's looking for help. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that is an example for psychological thinking. You don't have to study psychology. But if you have studied psychology, it's quite helpful. Right? I mean, that's like in personal interactions. If I meet a person, I do not treat everybody like being a patient. Right? Of course not. Right? But you have this attitude, this uh, mentality, this view of the world. You bring that with you. You know, in, there's so much in in, a, in, a, in psychological studies. You find many of this in, in the study of social work as well, or in philosophy. We don't have a mono monopoly yeah. as psychologists. So if I say psychological, that does not mean done by psychologists, but it is a certain way, certain approach. And that includes the point of saying no, you don't get more from me. Because I understand that it is a seduction, if you understand that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, it's a seduction for me. Of course I love it if they say the session was with you was much more productive than the session as a self-help group. I love to hear that. Right? <laughs> I want to hear that again. But here somebody should be in who says no, 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 no. That's not what it's about. Right? Maybe it is helpful if I have other fields in my life where I can act as real helper, you know, so, so that my ego is fed enough. Yeah. Okay. But this Feeding my ego can also happen by observing these wonderful processes which I have triggered. I didn't do it, I just gave a tiny little heavy other thought. For example, if I come as a consultant to a self help group, only if they invite me, I, I, no, I'm not controlling them, but if sometimes some invite me, um, then I make sure that this is not a guided group session. Because very often the, the result is that this group session is better. I mean, uh, I've learned how to do it. So it's easy. It's easy to be better than that. Like you play football with somebody from... Uh, what's this Saloniki? Is, is Pau. Pau Saloniki. <laughs> okay. I mean, he's better than you are. So, okay. uh, so in, in the beginning I say, Tonight we are not having a group session. I'm here to discuss with you what are, you have invited me, there must be a reason, at least a question, maybe a problem, maybe a conflict, maybe an uncertainty, how shall we go on? Let's discuss about that. So I asked them, uh, and then I say, well, how did you do until now? 
Uh, was there another proposal while to proceed? And then it's getting interesting because I'm always pointing at you, that's not very polite. Let's say this one. <laughs> this one says, um, I had an idea, but I did not dare to say, okay, now I'm here, I'm going to protect you, speak loud, you know. And then this guy brings the solution. The only thing I have to say, well, well that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And the closing remark very often is that I say a professional would do this and this, but I don't know if that is appropriate for you. I only give you the information. Maybe I don't think. And in, in reality, very often, the closing remark is I have nothing to add. Paul was here. Well, yeah. Since he made this proposal, since you said, why didn't you tell us earlier? Since you said, I agree completely, that's a brilliant idea, that's the moment I should go, right? It's only to make sure it, it is all right, because they cannot know that is all right. You know? It's like, it's always difficult to make comparisons with children, because they are not children, right? But if a child comes and says, Daddy, I did it this way, is that okay? You know? Of course you can say, give it to me, I can do that better. Okay, right? Or you say, that is really okay. Or maybe you could, uh, if you do it like this, it might be more stable. Try that out. You know? That's a little yeah. bit similar to that. So the, the, the headline is always to find out the potentials and show them their own potentials. Because sometimes the potential is there, but they don't see that. So that is, that is my professional behavior. Mm -hmm. And for this, Group experience and some psychological attitude is very, very helpful. Is that an answer? Yes. Yeah. That's why I found very helpful my training in humanistic psychology because in psychology they emphasize similar elements with the core elements of self help groups. Yes. I think I have. Uh, Etc. Yeah. Okay. In looking over your career today, what do you feel best about? About? Your, in looking over your career no, today, yeah. what okay. do you feel best about? <laughs> the best of you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, that, um, I must admit that is a new question. <laughs> um, Well, I, I would say uh, there were so many uh, coincidences, uh, incidents, uh, lucky events that happened. Uh, I can only be thankful to what, what happened. Um, I do not belong to these people who said, who think uh, I have made my career. You know, I, I did not construct my career. I, I rather feel uh, it happened to me. I know it's not the complete truth, but um, I think that it's, it's the encounter with uh, so many people, uh, both in the groups um, and in the network of colleagues. Um, so that was very enriching, of course. Um, maybe also the, the, the feeling that it is a success story. Mm -hmm. I have not made it, I have not written it, but I was part of it. I mean, that's always good to, to feel part of something bigger. We call it sometimes a movement, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but it's something bigger. It's bigger than what I have done, it's bigger than what we have done in tiny little Gießen in uh, Germany. Uh, um, just to be an observer, I'm, I'm an observer activist, right? Um, I write a lot about it, which, which may bring you in a distance, you know, start to reflect what, what is it about. And of course, after such a long time, 
to become old and to become an old timer and a veteran uh, has not only uh, positive uh, <laughs> elements, but one positive thing is that you have a view of the development, a view of the history. You have a more comprehensive picture of what it is. You are no longer uh, so focused, but like a camera, you know, you can, I don't know how you say in English, if the camera goes away and the picture gets, mm -hmm. gets mm -hmm. like a zoom, yes, 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 thank you. Uh, and the picture suddenly gets more and more complete. It also becomes more and more complex, right? So every answer you find opens three new questions, or maybe ten, or I don't know. Um, but but that is a very good feeling for me to um, to have a kind of overview. Clear kind of overview. Overview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the last question: What are the some What are some of the most important lessons we have learned in your work to, until today? that might be helpful to others working in, in the area. Do start. Do start. <laughs> um, <clears throat> endurance. I mentioned that before, you know, endurance. I, I learned the word endurance from motorsports. They have these uh, motor bicycles which go cross country, you know. And and I always thought, what, what does it mean by endurance? Is it the endurance of the driver or of the machine? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not a hard test you know, mm -hmm. for both, right? And I think in our field, like you are the best example for, uh, it needs, in German, we say it needs a long breath, right? It's not something for sprinters. It's mm -hmm. something for long-distance runners, yeah. okay? And the road doesn't go like this, it rather goes like that. It is not always in your hand that you are under the influence of other much more powerful agencies like state and party and politics and church and, and professional things, etc. etc. And the coincidences in between. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And um, that means, as the Alcoholics Anonymous say, you alone can do it, but you can't do it alone, which means watch out for partners. Uh, where are the nice guys and where are those who share your interests? Or if they do not share your interests, who has an interest which fits to yours. Yeah. It might be different, but, but uh, in this place, you know, like for example, somebody thinks maybe self help might save money. I would say most probably it will not, but, but okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> if that is your driving force, okay, okay, yeah. okay, let's go, right? Yes. Um, yeah, and perhaps the last thing, learn to try to trust in the capabilities of, of the people. That is the basic thing. If you do not really trust, um, then run for it. That's okay. Would you like to add something else? Or? No. Thank you for having me and uh, sorry guys, it was a bit long. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.